Gosh, they do not have one. Yeah, yeah. Fast yeah. wins. Not worth it. That cold blood. I get killed by one. Let's do this. I'm seeing if I'm going to mess up this one. I have a freak the audio on that last recording was a little wonky, so I'm just going to have to dispense with that. But fortunately, I don't think there's anything in there that, that like, at least from a homework perspective, we're not going to try and uh, need to recreate. Okay, um, still working on grading the exam. Uh, you are getting a homework today that's due uh, on Friday. This is your first homework uh, related to bolted connections, but all the outstanding homework's graded, so um, hopefully by the end of the week you'll have a much more complete picture of where you're at in class. Um, today what we're going to do is we're going to finish our discussion on the um, limit states and uh, uh, essentially the, the service conditions regarding bolted connections. We talked a little bit about that uh, during the last lecture. Um, but today, we're going to get into a full-blown start-to-finish bolted connection analysis example. All right? Did everybody get the code? Oh, it's not. No. In the last class uh, that we had, you had mentioned that the rivets were more economical and they varied more. No, no, less economical. I'm sorry, less economical. Yes. So... If they vary more, is the least amount of the rivet more than the highest amount of a bolt? Just out of curiosity. Um, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to go back into the, the literature to see, but what I can tell you is that generally high strength bolts um, present at least enough capacity to match rivets, if not more, particularly A490s. Um, so, I, I, I honestly, I'd have to go back to the literature to see, but we, from from a new construction standpoint, we haven't used rivets for 30, 40 years, something like that. So, I mean, we're not going to be going back to using those anytime soon. And again, I think as a up-and-coming structural engineer, the only time you really ever see them is if you were rating an old structure. And when you rate them, you're, to be frank, you're conservative as hell when you estimate the capacity. So... Um, but yeah, the, the answer of does the, the highest possible capacity rivet uh, mirror the lowest capacity bolt? Possibly, but there's so much statistical variability I wouldn't count on it. So. That's a good question though, I like that. Any other questions? It's good stuff. Okay, um, let's go into layout requirements. Now I do want to give a quick recap on bolt shear and bolt bearing capacity um, that we talked about last time. This slide has a lot of information packed into it, but basically, in a, in a nutshell, this summarizes everything that we talked about uh, on Monday. So, for a bearing type connection, we have two strength limit states that we need to adhere to. The first is bolt shear capacity, and the second is bolt bearing capacity. Now, for bolt shear capacity, we discussed, you know, we have a bolt. We're talking about how much force it takes to shear the bolt tab. And there are a series of variables that go into that, whether or not the threads are included in the shear plane, what diameter bolt are we using, is it group A versus group B, um, are the threads included, excluded, all, all, all that, you know, single shear, double shear, all that stuff. In the end, though, it's the, the calculations are fairly repetitive and fairly easy to compute, so much so that we have a nice little pretty table on page 7-22 that summarizes all the capacities per bolt based on all the different iterations, whether we're in single shear, double shear, whether the threads are included, excluded, whether group A, group B, dependent upon the diameter, it's an easy lookup. So from here on out, I don't expect you... Or this is what this is teams, right? My, if somebody's calling my office line, I don't know who they are, but I'm going to have to call them back. Sorry. Sorry. Um, it's technology these days. All right. So, um, so, so from here on out, to be clear, I do not expect you to, um, I do not expect you to calculate the capacity the way that we did in the quick exercise during the last example. I'm perfectly fine if you just look up bolt shear capacity. Here. Um, now, bolt bearing 
we kind of need to compute that because it is very connection specific, like it depends on the geometry of a given connection. But bulk bearing capacity is basically ascertaining the capacity of the plate material as opposed to the bulk. So what we're doing is we're asking whether or not the bolt is going to tear out uh, a, a section of the plate or whether the bolt hole is going to plastify and, and ovalize. And so we have a nominal capacity expression that's the minimum of 1.2 LCTFU or 2.4 dBTFU. Um, the V value is 0.75 uh, and everything's very cut and dry. The computations are really easy because we have a, a clear uh, edge distance for internal uh, bolts versus a clear uh, distance for edge bolts and the uh, expressions are really easy. Probably the most um, pertinent detail to pay attention to is that because we're actually looking at the physical dimensions of the plate, the, the, the plate itself, our um, hole diameter, we're using the actual hole diameter. So we're taking the bolt diameter plus a sixteenth of an inch instead of an eighth of an inch. Remember the reason that we add an eighth of an inch is because we're adding a sixteenth twice. Um, and one of those is because of the actual dimensions of the hole. The other is because we don't consider that little bit of a ring of material effective in transferring load to the member as a whole. We're not looking at the member as a whole here. We're looking at just the connection. Okay. Um, is it going to go? It's not liking me. Oh, it's because I clicked teams. That's what it is because now it's... Now, there it is. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about connection layout requirements. And um, what I mean by that is I want to identify how far apart we should space bolts from each other and how far apart bolts should be from the edge of the plate. Because as a structural engineer, you need to detail the connections if you're in design lane, you need to know how to do that. Okay. Um, so the way that the spec lines this out is we have uh, minimum bolt spacing requirements, maximum bolt spacing requirements, minimum edge distance requirements, maximum edge distance requirements. So let's start off with minimum bolt spacing. So this comes directly from the specification. This is on page 16.1-130. And what I have here is a, uh, this is just a screenshot directly from the spec. Um, and uh, so this is on minimum spacing. And so it says, the distance between standard, oversized, or slotted holes shall not be less um, of two and two uh, shall not be less than two and two thirds times the nominal diameter of the fastener. Okay. Um, now, what we what that means is that if I have a bolt diameter, I multiply it by two and two thirds or eight thirds, um, and that is the minimum allowable bolt spacing uh, to be used for high strength structural bolts. Now, there is a preferred bolt spacing of three times the bolt diameter. If we're in design land, I'll make sure and tell you whether or not we, I want you to use minimum bolt spacing or preferred bolt spacing. But for the purposes of checking whether or not a connection adheres to the specification, you're checking minimum and maximum. You're not checking the preferred. So, now as we talked about last time, why do we think? Uh, um, why do you think we have a minimum bolt spacing limit? So, in other words. Like, what issues would arise if the bolts are too close together? What would be the problem with that? We answered that question last time, but what was it? What happens if bolts get too close together? No, no, that's what, that's if they get too far apart. What happens if they get too close together? You can't, you can't tighten them. They're, you can, they, they'll knock into each other. You can't get a wrench around them to tighten them out. The bolts have to have some degree of space between them in order to actually facilitate construction. Okay, so the minimum bolt spacing, why is there a minimum bolt space requirement to facilitate construction? To actually be able to put the, the element together. Yes, sir? And wouldn't it also weaken that area if you had to put close together? That's a good question. So I, I want to address that. So he's, it, what he asked was, wouldn't, if the bolts get too close together, wouldn't that limit the capacity? Wouldn't that reduce the capacity under bolt bearing? The answer is yes, okay? But the further answer is you still have to check bolt bearing to see whether or not uh, it, it adheres to capacity. You can't, what, what I'm getting at is you can't just detail a connection such that the spacing is, is between minimum and maximum and say, oh, it's fine, it's not going to fail under bolt bearing. That's not the case, right? You still need to check the, uh, the capacity under bolt shear and bolt bearing to ensure it has enough capacity to withstand the load it's subjected to. And let me give you a, a salient example of what I mean by that. Um, I could very easily detail a connection that met bolt shear or that met bolt shear requirements 
and met spacing and edge distance requirements, and I could do that for a plate that's one thirty-second of an inch thick, right? Let me tell you something. What will happen? The plate will tear out, right? Because it's just really thin. You still need to check this stuff to make sure it's going to work. Does that make sense? Is everybody else okay with that? That's a really good question, and I really want to point that out. So you're not wrong, but it doesn't mean you, if you meet these limits, you ignore the bulk bearing check. You still have to do it. Sound good? All right, that's good stuff. I like that. Okay, so minimum bolt, uh, minimum bolt spacing. What about minimum edge distance? So what I mean by minimum edge distance is what is the closest that you can drill that hole to the edge of the plate? And unlike um, bolt spacing, it's not a formulaic calculation. It's a lookup, okay? It comes from table J3.4. This is on page 16.1-131. And basically what it says is dependent upon your bolt diameter, there is the minimum edge distance from the center of that hole to the edge of the connected part, okay? And um, for the most part, it's usually plus a quarter of an inch. There are some deviations for that. So like, for example, if your bolt diameter is an inch and an eighth, the minimum edge distance is from an inch and a half. Um, to be clear, um, as I mentioned earlier, the reason for a minimum bolt spacing is to facilitate construction. The reason for a minimum edge distance is to facilitate fabrication. Um, in other words, these are as close to the edge of the plate that fabricators are comfortable specking the hole. Okay? Um, so what I'm getting at, these edge distances, these come from standard fabrication practices. They come from workmanship tolerances. These are not um, formulaic computations. Um, this is essentially as far as the fabricators are comfortable in pushing the envelope. Okay, So that's why there's no real formula. It's just based off of rules of thumb in the fab shop. So that's why it's kind of a lookup. Does that make sense? Again, for most of it, it's a quarter, uh, the bolt diameter plus a quarter of an inch, but not always, which is why you got to look up. Okay, now what about maximum bolt spacing and maximum edge distance? Okay, all right, so um, first off, for edge distance, for edge distance, there is a single limit, okay? And what the spec says is that the maximum edge distance um, from the center of any bolt to the nearest edge shall be either 12 times the thickness or 6 inches, whichever governs. So the maximum edge distance, regardless of, of condition or of, of plate condition, is the minimum of 12T or 6 inches. But for bolt spacing, the maximum limit on bolt spacing is contingent. It's dependent on the plate condition. In other words, if you have painted members or if you have unpainted members subjected to corrosion, you have a less stringent limit than you have unpainted members. So if you have unpainted members or weathering steel or any uh, uh, um, uh, steel that's subject to corrosion, the spacing shall not exceed either 14 times the thickness or 7 inches. Okay? And again, we talked about this last time. What happens if the bolts get too far apart? If they get too far apart, then water can seep between the plates. And if water can seep between the plates, that can lead to corrosion, and corrosion is no good which is why there are different bolt spacing limits dependent upon whether or not your steel is painted. Because if your steel is painted, corrosion isn't as much of a concern, right? So that's why the, the limit is a little less stringent, okay? Um, now, to be clear, um, there are two limits in the spec, either 14T, 7 inches, or 24T and 12 inches for bolt spacing. Unless I state otherwise, we are always going to assume the worst case scenario, which is 14T and 7 inches. Which, by the way, if you're designing a connection and your bolts are more than 7 inches apart, that's probably not an economical connection to begin with. So, um, uh, so we're probably not going to be pushing that very often. Um, one thing I will tell you is that, um, so let me, let me go here. So this is sort of the nice little pretty summary of all of the bolt spacing and edge distance requirements that we need to employ for a bolted connection. I will go ahead and tell you an incredibly common bolt configuration in actual practice is to space your bolts out on a three inch grid. So drill holes on a grid that's three inches by three inches. Because three inches by three inches, 
will tend to meet bolt spacing and edge distance requirements for three quarter inch bolts, seven eighths inch bolts, and one inch diameter bolts, which are the three most common that we use. Okay. Personally, I think that if you're doing um, a regular amount of connections over and over and over again, and you want to simplify the fab process, there is a logic behind that. If you're designing a unique connection, though, you might as well design it to be as efficient as possible. So you might be able to get away with the two inch spacing to shrink the amount of connection material that you need. Um, but yeah, so these are our bolt spacing limitations. These are our edge distance requirements. Everything is formulaic except for the edge distance requirements on the minimum side. And again, that just comes from fabrication practices. All right. Any questions? All right. So we got a problem to do today. It's, five, it's high time we actually do a full-blown bolted connection problem. Okay. So I have a bearing type connection. And I'm going to pull this up here in the notebook. I have a bearing type connection, and I want to determine the design strength on this connection. Okay? Um, I've given you a lot of data here, and so a lot of this is just categorizing the data and making sure that you understand where everything is coming from. But what I've given you is I've got um, two plates, and just to introduce some terminology to you, this is what's called a lap joint, LAP, or a lapped connection, because you just got a plate, a plate, lapped on top of one another, okay? So we're going to determine the design strength for the bearing type connection shown. We have A36 steel um, with 7 8 inch A325, uh, or 7 8 inch diameter A325 bolts. I did tell you the threads are excluded from the shear plane, um, so we're going to determine the design strength of this connection, and we are going to assess whether or not the connection meets layout requirements. Okay? Notice I've got that 3-inch grid, like I mentioned earlier, although the edge distance on the plates uh, are 2 inches. Okay? Now, one of the things I will tell you is that um, we are not assessing for this problem gross section yielding, net section fracture, or block shear rupture, but we darn well could. Okay? And I've got to believe that if I have a plate with four bolts like this, that if I gave you that, you could compute gross section yielding, net section fracture, and block shear rupture for that. It's just a plate. Gross area, net area is gross area minus the area loss due to the presence of bolt holes. Pop quiz. What would the shear lag factor for this plate be? At least one. At least one. That was a very diplomatic answer. Remember, shear lag factor case one, case two. Case one says if all the cross-sectional elements are connected by fasteners or welds. There's only one cross-sectional element. It's a plate. It's connected by a fastener or weld. You is one. So. All right. So let's start the beginning of this problem. Let's start with collecting some data. Um, actually, you know what? Let's do this a little differently. Let, let's do this a little differently. Let's just handle each of our limit states, right? So we have... Three things that we're ultimately going to check, bolt, shear, bolt, bearing, and layout requirements. So let's handle each of these one at a time, okay? Now, again, I think you're going to find that this is probably a lot more straightforward than you would think. So let's start off with bolt shear. Now, bolt shear, what we're going to do is we're going to use table 7-1 on page 7-22. If you have not yet tabbed that in your manual, I would. We are going to use that a lot. And so I want everybody to open up their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual and go to that table because everybody brought it. Everybody brought it. Because everybody brought it. I don't think they, they reference uh, steel design in that environmental textbook. It's not environmental. Oh, it's not environmental. You need to cover on it. It's hydraulics, isn't it? talking about hydraulics in here about generating some friction. Okay. I'll keep telling jokes. I'll just throw you for a loop, I promise. All right. Oh so, my gosh. 
I love this job. Okay, so table 7-1, page 7-22. In order to utilize this table, we're going to need some data. So let's start off with um, the bolt diameter. What's the bolt diameter for this problem? 7-8. Seven 7-8, eight. Seven okay. Now, um, let's start off with the group. Are we in group A or are we in group B? Group A. A325 bolts. Is group A. Now are we in group A in or group A X? X. The threads are excluded, right? So group AX. Now the other question, let's take a look at the connection. Are these bolts experiencing single shear or are they experiencing double shear? Single. They are experiencing single shear. There is only a single shear plane through the bolt, right? So what I have here is I have a plate. <coughs> And I have this, right? Here's the hole, right? So the bolt looks like that, right? And that right there is the only shear plane going through the bolt right there. This is a single shear plane. Does that make sense? There's two plates, but there's only one plane between them. So what this means is that this is... Single shear. So taking all of this data, what is BRN for a single bolt? Thirty point seven. What? Kips. Kips. I'm going to write that as thirty point seven kips per bolt. Okay. Now, let's all make sure we're on the same page. How many bolts are in the connection? What's that? Scroll up. Four. Four. See, if it wasn't the pipe. Now. <laughs> Four bolts, three reservoirs. Okay. Still one. All right. So what that means then is, so here's my notation, just so everybody's aware. So phi little r is per connector. Phi big R is for the entire connection. So... 30.7 kips per bolt. And again, the fee value is already baked into this. All right. I think I can do this one in my head. Um, so 30 times 4 is 120, 28, uh, 122.8. Did I do that right? I don't know. Let's see. It's not like there's 20 people in here with Cassio FX 115 ES pluses or somewhere trying to get the calculators. All right. So that's our bolt shear capacity. That's how much load it takes to shear these bolts in half. Okay. The next thing we've got uh, with appropriate factors to safety and all that. So now what we need to do is assess our bolt bearing uh, capacity. Okay. Now, I want to make a point about bolt bearing now that isn't going to be super important now, but will be important later. Okay? The nature of a connection is just that, to connect part A to part B. Okay? So, whenever you're assessing a bolt bearing uh, limit state, there are always two cases. The members or plates transferring load that way, and the members or plates transferring load uh, that way. 
Okay? There's always two cases. But if we look at the problem, let's look at these two members. Both of them are plates that are a half inch thick. Both of them have the same number of bolts. Both of them are made with the same amount or the same grade of steel. And both of them have the same bolt spacing and edge distance requirements. So because they're literally the same member, I'm only going to check one case of bolt bearing. Although theoretically there are always two, right? We're going to have problems later where it's a W section connected to a plate. And those are different cases of bolt bearing. The W section might be grade A992, the plate may be A36, so you have to check both. Does that make sense? We're, we'll do that later, but right, so right now, like they're the, it's the same plate lapped on top of one another, and that's just so that we understand the math. Okay. <coughs> okay, so bolt bearing. Right. So what I'm going to do so that's the plate that I'm yanking on and I've got two well I've got four bolts. So I've got one two three four. Okay? Now Somebody help me out with dimensions. All right. What is this dimension here? And what is this dimension here? Three and two. Three. three and two. All right. So, so using my terminology, this is S. And this is LE. Okay. This is my clear edge distance, okay? Now, ultimately what I am interested in though when I do a bolt bearing computation, if you recall, is the clear distance. I want the clear distance from here to here. And I want the clear distance from here to here, okay? Now, we have a name for that. We call it LC, but we have Designators for that, L-C-E, L-C-I, okay? So fortunately, the computation is really easy, okay? So the first thing that we do is we recognize that we have a 7 8 inch diameter bolt, so we need to compute the whole diameter, but I want you to fight every instinct that you currently have right now to recognize that that is plus a sixteenth of an inch, not an eighth of an inch. I know some of y'all are going to hate me on that, but that's just kind of the truth there. So our whole diameter is 15 sixteenths. In other words, if you have a 7 eighths inch diameter bolt, you are grabbing a 15 sixteenths diameter drill bit and drilling the hole to that diameter. That is the actual physical dimensions of the hole. All right? Now, does anybody remember the formula for LCE and LCI? Anybody remember those formulas? No. LCE is what? I'll do this. LE minus half a whole diameter. Now you're doing the next one, but I'll, I'll go ahead and do the I'll do the numbers here. So this is two inches minus a half of fifteen sixteenths, and when you chug that out, um, I, I, I'm fine with that being decimals. Um, it ends up being something like one point five three one inches. Now somebody else tell me what's the formula for this one. S minus the whole diameter. What's well, S minus the whole diameter? Yes. Because what we're doing is we're computing this clear distance right here. And so if I know the bolt spacing, take half a whole diameter, half a whole diameter, and I get that clear distance. So it's S minus the full whole diameter. So it's 3 inches 
minus 15 sixteenths, which um, I think you get something like 2.063. I'll go ahead and do that for you. All right. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that for the plate, we know that the thickness is a half an inch. Does anybody know what FU for that plate is going to be? 58. 58 KSI. Now, keep in mind it's a plate. So, technically... 2-5, but doesn't matter. It's the same value. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, our nominal capacity expression that we are using is the minimum of 1.2 LCTFU and 2.4 DBTFU. Okay, so the way that we're going to do this, though, is we're going to have to compute a nominal capacity for an edge bolt and a nominal capacity for an interior bolt and then combine them accordingly. Okay, so the way that I like to do this, because I, I like to do it in such a way that it's the minimum amount of button crunching as possible. Okay, this is how I like to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make three computations. First thing I'm going to do is 1.2 LCE TFU, okay? So that is 1.2 times 1.531 times a half an inch times 58 KSI. Tell me what we get for this. And we'll say two, or we'll just say one decimal place to make our lives easy. I got 53.3. All right, 53.3 kips. Because it's KSI times inches times inches. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now what we're going to do is 1.2 LCI TFU. So essentially the same computation, just a new LC. Okay, and so what do we get for this? Second? Yeah. Okay. And now the third one I'm going to compute is 2.4 dB TFU. And we're using the bolt diameter, not the hole diameter. So 2.4 times 7 eighths of an inch times a half inch times 58 KSI. So what do we get for that? Sixty point nine. Sixty point nine. Do I have a second? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to say that the nominal capacity of an edge bolt is the minimum of one point two LCE TFU and two point four dB TFU. And what is that? So it's the minimum of this and this, which is 53.3, right? But then R and I is the minimum of 1.2 LCI TFU and 2.4 DB TFU. And what is that? 60.9. 60 60.9. So let me let me just 
make a point on something. Let's talk about this behaviorally. What is this saying about the edge bolts? Are they going to tear out, or is the bolt hole going to mobilize or plastify? Which one govern? The one point, the one point two, right? And remember, the 1.2 is the one that's related to tear out, right? So the edge bolts are going to tear out. What are the interior bolts going to do? They're going to plastify, right? See, I showed you an image in a previous lecture. Uh, in the previous lecture, I'm going to pull that image up because I kind of I think this is pretty important. So, like, looky here. So here we have the same plate. We have one bolt tearing out, and we have one bolt where the hole was plastified, right? That's exactly what happened here, right? The connection uh, um, that we're looking at here is very analogous to the one we're looking at here. One bolt is governed by tear out, one's governed by mobilization. So kind of nifty stuff. Now, <clears throat> remember, these little R's are the capacity of the individual connectors, okay? But I want the capacity of the connection. So in order to compute the capacity of the connection, I need so many of these plus so many of these. And so my question to you is that for this connection, how many edge bolts do we have and how many interior bolts do we have? Two and Two and two, exactly. The ones on this row right here, those are the edge bolts, so there's two of them, and there's two interior bolts. So so that's only with respect to the axial. Yeah, the, in, in the direction of the load, yes. So, like, going back to, so hold on, so going back to uh, this right here, so, for example, in this image right here, right. this has four edge bolts and 16 interior bolts. So, so this is going to be uh, 2 times 53.3 kips plus 2 times 60.9 kips, which is what? Two twenty-eight point four. Do I have a second on that? Is this my design capacity? No. What did I forget? You forgot the fee value. Fee value. It's really easy to forget fee on the last step. It's really easy to forget. So make sure you don't. So what is VRN now? 171.3. So when we did this, this tells us the capacity is 171.3 kips. What was the capacity for bolt shear? So which one governs? Bull shear. So, and honestly, we just don't know until we get into it. For example, if these plates were three eighths of an inch thick as opposed to a half inch thick, very possible bolt shear or bolt bearing would govern. You kind of just don't know until you get into it. So therefore, I would argue that um, for the, for the connection. R N is 122.8 kips. All right. Now, we have something left to check, right, which is our layout requirements. So, 
Now, in order to do layout requirements, we really only need a few dimensions. So we need S and we need LE, right? Because that's obviously what we're checking. But we also need, we're going to need the plate thickness, which is a half an inch. And we're going to need the bolt diameter, which is seven eighths of an inch thick. So I'm just writing those parameters down again so I don't have to keep scrolling up and down, back and forth. I just want to make sure that I have them. All right. Now, for bolt spacing, okay, so we have an S minimum of two and two thirds or eight thirds times the bolt diameter, which is eight thirds times seven eighths of an inch. So that's what, seven thirds or 2.33 inches? Did I get that right? Because the eights cancel. So that means those bolt, or wait, did I get that right? All right, now that's S min, what about S max? Somebody help me out. What is the maximum bolt spacing? The minimum of 14 T or 7 inches. So it's the minimum of 14 times a half an inch or 7 inches. But those are the same, right? Because 14 times a half is 7. So that's 7 inches. So what this is saying is that our bolt spacing has to be between that and that. What is our bolt spacing? It's three inches, so that's okay, right? That's good. That's between our limits. And so we just do the same thing for edge distance. So this, like I said, this really isn't all that hard. Um, now, how do we get minimum edge distance? We have to look it up. We can't just calculate it, right? So what is the minimum edge distance uh, according to table J3.4? For a connector that is seven eighths inches in diameter, what's the um, what's the minimum bolt spacing? One and an eight. What is the maximum uh, bolt spacing or maximum edge distance? <coughs> it's the minimum of what? There you go. But that's also six inches. So our edge distance needs to be between uh, one and one eighth and six inches, and our edge distance is actually two, two inches. So we're okay on this too. So basically what I would say is 
words are meant to. Now, if you want, one interesting thing to do would be we have two limit states right here. Bolt shear, bolt bearing. What about gross section yielding? Net section fracture. What about block shear rupture? Compute those and see if it is truly these limit states that actually govern the member as a whole or not. Right? So in other words, if I load this member, how is it actually going to fail? Because when we were doing tension members, we were assuming that the you know the connections were made of adamantium, that they, they were infinitely strong, and it was the tension member that was actually going to fail, but maybe not. Maybe the tension member's fine, it's the connection that's going to fail, right? So now you're equipped to check all of them and see which one actually governs the member, right? So, like, just as a real quick example, right, the plate is 9 inches wide, right? So this is going to be 0 0.9 times 36 KSI times 9 inches times a half inch. What's that? So, so far, this is governing, right? What about net section fracture? So, 0 0.75, 58 KSI. We have the net area, which is going to be 9 times a half inch minus, how many bolt holes am I subtracting? 2, Two times... Right, so 0.75 FU, net area, and U, right? So there's your net section fracture. And we, I'm not going to do block shear, but I mean, you could keep on doing that and see. I'm just curious, because what is net section fracture? Let's see what it is. 152.25. Ah, 152.25. Five second? Yeah. So here, this is kind of interesting. Like, if we had done this problem when we were looking at tension members, we would have completely ignored the fact that so far, actually what's going to fail are the bolts, not the member, right? Interesting stuff, isn't it? So, there is, yes? So when you figured out at the end of your example problem, the bolt spacing and everything, that we're talking about the scan class, how you have the secondary requirement. Um, let me say this. That question will be a little easier to answer when we get into connection design. So that, that'll be a little easier to answer. We'll, we'll talk about connection design. We'll also talk about designing to develop the full capacity, but we'll, we'll get to that later. You, you'll see what I mean when we talk about that. I don't want to, I don't want to overload that because that's a loaded question. So. All right, I'm going to pull the code up again, but that's all I got. We'll see you all on Friday.